In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome this morning, rather, rather frosty morning. I was struck by all of the readings uh, this this morning, and I wanted to to use though as a text something from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, in which he says, "I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaimed to you, which he himself had received, which you in turn received." in which you also stand, through which also you are being saved, this past, present, future. If you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. So something about receiving a message that's been passed down, that's proclaimed in the past, received today, held on to, and passed on in our turn. What are we going to do with it? And I was struck also by the fact that the readings all either are epiphanies, unveilings, showings of God, conversions, or have a conversion story embedded in them in the case of Paul. For instance, uh, we, have, we have three people here, three rather distinguished company. Isaiah, son of Amos, the first, one of the first and great prophets writing in the 8th century before Christ to warn Israel and Judah to, to mend their ways. And here he, he is early in this book of his prophecies, but it's, it's almost the starting. It, it, it should be chapter 1. It, it's when he was converted. It's when he was given his, his uh, message to proclaim. And it tells this amazing story of his vision of heaven in which God is surrounded by the angels and the thrones and they're all singing holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might as we do during the Eucharist, of course, which is where we get this from. And so Isaiah has this vision of the glory of God and of course he falls down feeling like I'm doomed, I'm seeing God and I, unworthy, am am in this place. Uh, You know, I'm a sinful person not worthy of, of receiving this vision. And the seraph comes in and, and says, no, don't be afraid, and touches his lips with the coal, with the, you know, burning sensation. And yet it's a freeing sensation. He, he now is relieved of his feeling of unworthiness and guilt. And he stands, and as it were, then the, then the word goes out, we have a message to proclaim, who will, who will go? And here he says, here am I, send me. You know, one of the great conversion stories in which he goes from somebody frightened and not sure of what he's doing to somebody who's been filled with the Holy Spirit and emboldened to go out and proclaim the the good news. Or, as if you keep reading, the bad news for the people who are not doing good. Uh But, uh, you know, part of the good news is you have to turn and change if if you're going in the wrong direction. And then we have, of course, this story uh, embedded in the letter of Corinth of Paul talking about himself as having been somebody who persecuted the church. Now he's planting the church, but before he was persecuting the church. He said, when I was young, when he was a Pharisee, you know, he heard about this heresy of Jesus and he was persecuting the church. But on the road to Damascus, he had an overwhelming experience of of, of light. It blinded him. And he heard the voice of Jesus saying, saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And it was Jesus saying, now I'm going to turn you around and send you out to plant churches. Of course, he didn't just go ahead and start the next day. He had to go to Damascus, be received by the hesitant community, be schooled in what it means to be a follower of Jesus out in the desert for years, join the community in Antioch, work with Barnabas, his, his, his elder, and then maybe 15 years later, begin his work of church planting. It took him a while. He had to, had to be formed and ready to be sent. And then, of course, there's the call of Peter, which is told in different versions in the different Gospels. Here, it's Jesus has come back up into Galilee, and he's, he's now teaching on the, on the banks of the, of the sea, and he 
He asks Peter, who we're not clear if he knows already or not, but he's certainly willing to lend him his boat. There he is, he and his partners, uh, the sons of Zebedee, fixing their nets after fishing all night unsuccessfully. But sure, I'll, 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 you can borrow my boat, put out, to, put out into the water 10 or 15 yards out so that your voice can echo to all the people listening. And he teaches. And then he tells Peter, go on out a little bit, a little bit further and, and drop your nets. Well, we've tried all night, but if you say so. And then, of course, the miraculous catch, such that it strains the nets. And his partners come and it almost sinks both their boats, at which point he understands that he is in the presence of something uncanny and miraculous and awesome, God in some form. And he says, you know, unworthy, I am unworthy, I am a sinful man. Please let me go. And Jesus says, no, I'm not letting you go. From now on, you will be fishing for people. And he leaves everything to follow him. So here again is a, a conversion story from, from one way of life, in this case, you know, a simple fishing life, to being a disciple and then later the, the, the pillar of the church. His name changing from Simon to Peter, meaning Petrus, meaning Cephas, meaning rock on which the church is standing. And Saul also gets a name change. Their life changes. These are, these are very dramatic stories, aren't they? Aren't they? And we, we might wonder, uh, how does this apply to me? How does this apply to our times? Are these kinds of conversions and calls still happening? Are we still being sent out to do this, this work of proclaiming the good news we have received? Are we holding firm and are we passing on? That's a question. So it seemed to me, and perhaps you might want to think about that, how did you come to believe? Was there a, a, a light shining in the heavens sort of experience or was it more gradual? Or where are you in that, in that uh, sort of journey of faith? Some people have extremely dramatic experiences of, of the awesome and the infinite and the uncanny, some of which they're not sure what to make of. Is this God? Is this my own mind? What, what is it? I'm thinking here of a couple of people who are, who are not believers, who are atheists. Alan Lightman, who is a, a physicist and a writer, talks about an experience of being, oh, just on a small boat out, out I think, in, in, in the New York Bay fishing or up in Massachusetts, I forget, and he's lying down just kind of napping and his, the universe and the sky dissolve and he's you know, suddenly lost his sense of self into the universe. And he's writing about this as a physicist. I have no idea what happened, but who knows? <laughs> you know, put that behind me in the rear view mirror and just kind of tuck that away. Barbara, uh, Erickman, uh, uh, she's the novelist. Er, uh, her last name is escaping me at the moment. But she's also a non-believer who had this uh, memoir recently when she talks about her experience of what she can only describe as, as, as sort of this sense of otherness, this godlike experience. But since she wasn't a believer, again, that's been sort of filed in the past, not sure what to do with it. Now, when you're called by God like that, that's God's call, not yours, right? You, you're not in control of when you're going to have an experience of God's presence. God is. And it might not be something that's so transcendently awesome like that. It, it might be an experience of the of the awesome beauty of nature on a top of a mountain. Or it might come through suffering and loss that causes you to reevaluate who you are and what you're doing. You know, the, our life uh, deals with us. We don't always deal with, with it the way we would like. You know, it's sort of like that uh, David Byrne song with, uh, whoa, how did I get here? You know, what is this life I'm leading? Who's Beautiful house is this, whose beautiful wife. We can come to a point where we look at our own lives going, how did I get here and, and what, where should I go now? That's also one of those experiences that are a little out of our control, but you know what's in our control? Both the time before and the time after. There's a time of preparation and a time of reflection that we, we can do something about. People who are raised 
in a religious upbringing have a framework in which to understand a, a, a transcendent experience as God. Somebody who pray to God and are listening for some sort of answer, maybe not a voice, but a sign or, or, or something that unfolds in one's life. They, they, they're preparing for God's appearance and call. Their vocation may, may be changed. Maybe you've always done what you've done, or maybe sometimes those midlife crises, those reevaluations, change the way you're going to live in the world because you've reflected on these events that happened to you. My wife, Mary, she's always wanted to be an art teacher since high school, so she's had a vocation in the world. She certainly didn't marry somebody who thought he'd be a priest. You know, that changed. <laughs> Not entirely in ways that she was, you know, expecting. But we all have gone through different phases in our life. And when we reflect on them, do we see the hand of God? Do we see a call toward a new kind of life? Whether it's connected with our vocation in the world or a new way of being and doing things in the world. Paul was already a trained religious leader, but he became a new religious leader in, this, in, in the Christian church. Simon changed from being a simple fisherman to being a leader of others, you know, something nobody would have thought. So we have, when we hear this call, a time to prepare and a time to reflect. Now it strikes me that the pattern of our Christian life might follow what Karl Barth, the great theologian, called the pattern of Christian life of being called, gathered, and sent. So we've talked about being called. But is that just sort of a uh, independent individual thing? Or, you know, here you are. We're going to do an independent study on what it means to be a Christian. That's not the way it works in our tradition, in our church. You're gathered into a group to be formed as disciples. It's not that Jesus individually contacted 12 people and sent them on a journey of faith. He called them together to be trained as a group of disciples so that they, with him, learned what he was doing, his healing and teaching. Listen to him uh, talk about the parables and, and, and talk later about what they mean. And he sent them out two by two to go practice these arts of healing and teaching and proclamation so that when he died and resurrected, and they witnessed this, as Paul said, and he ascended, they had been prepared as a gathered group and then led by the Holy Spirit to go out and start this new Jesus movement, this church in which they spread that good news that they'd received so that they began then to plant churches and to appoint deacons and overseers and so on and begin this process of spreading the good news which is none other than what Isaiah was called to do, be a light to the Gentiles, a fulfillment of that process. Israel was not meant by itself to have the revelation of God, but to be the light that spreads this to the world. And just so the church is not, oh, even as a gathered group of individuals, of, of disciples, called to just enjoy their, you know, being elect and being, you know, being in the know, but called to go out there and spread the good news and do the good work and plant the new kingdom, this beloved community that Martin and Howard Thurman and others have talked about, this way of being in the world and healing the world. And that raises the third point, to be sent. We are called, gathered in, in, in discipleship, and then sent, each in our own ways in big or little ways, in dramatic ways or very mundane and quiet ways. It can be, yeah, planting a church or leading a, a movement, but it can also be writing a note and praying. But you're doing it with the intention, you know, of loving your neighbor and of, of following the Christ-like example. You're conscious of that. You've been sent to do that. And, and, and you know, sometimes you might feel like Isaiah you know, like, like Simon, that, that you're unworthy. I'm a sinful person. But you know, God seems to use just those types of folks. So you can't get out of it that way. You can't just say, I don't have any skills or gifts or special qualities. No, you still got to go. You know, you still have to be sent to help, help this world. Love your neighbors, even your enemies. And so to be sent, 
you know, uh, is part of the deal. And how we're sent, you know, what it means to be in community, that's a learning process too. You know, sometimes we've done, you know, things as a gathered community called the church that we, in retrospect, look back and say that that was wrong. We're trying to learn. We're trying to be guided by the Holy Spirit into new ways. I was thinking as I was preparing this sermon, in particular, we're in Black History Month, of this uh, Episcopal uh, priest, the first black Episcopal priest, Absalom Jones. Anybody know of him? Raise your hand if you heard the name. Okay, we got a few. Seminary student coming up. No extra points. <laughs> Absalom Jones was, was the first black Episcopal priest back in 1802 or so. I, I, well, next week I'm going to talk about him in my sermon, so this is just a, a preview. But his feast day, he died on February 13th, is next week. So it's a good occasion to reflect on him. Born into slavery, who moved to Philadelphia, became learned, bought his wife's freedom and, and, and then was freed himself, became the founder of a free African society, started, you know, was preaching in a biracial church that then discriminated against the blacks, and so started his own church, his own black church of free Africans. Of this, and, and then that became part of the Episcopal Church. It's an amazing story. So uh, we'll talk about it next week. But that shows this tradition, this this teaching tradition that he exemplifies uh, of the Black Church talking about the Exodus story, the Exodus story of being in bondage but being led and released out of captivity into freedom toward the Promised Land. And that is exactly the same story I'm talking about, right? to be praying, to be preparing, to calling, and then, then to receive that call to go, to go as a community, to be led and formed, in this case by Moses, to a new land. So the black church teaches us much of how to receive her tradition and reapply it to the conditions they lived in, and they still do, in fact. So we'll talk more about that next week. But it just goes to show you don't have to travel to the Near East or back in time to find Isaiah's and Paul's and Simon's and prophets and disciples and apostles. They might be your neighbors, you know, fellow Americans. They might be you. For we are all called, gathered and sent to carry on the work of proclamation, healing and striving for justice and peace. It's, it's right there in your baptismal covenant, actually the summary of what it means to live as a disciple of Jesus, called to be part of this Jesus movement. And so when you hear the call, you can say, here I am, send me. In the name of Christ, amen. I invite you to join me in affirming your faith 